Because it's in Britain's interest that we have a strong and stable Eurozone, it was important to establish a permanent mechanism for bailing out Eurozone countries. I think the Eurozone has come to a very interesting pass. Um, I'm on record and have been for the last 12 years as being sceptical that the Eurozone is capable of of pulling together the very disparate economic performance of what is now 16 countries. The designers of the Eurozone explicitly said, we see this as a route to political union. I think as a concept to force the currencies together as the way to get political union, and the electorate saying, oh, we must all be politically unified because we now have the Euro, I think is implausible. The difficulty is if you don't do that, then you, then you don't have the mechanisms you need to keep a currency together. And so that is you don't have control over the budgets, the, the, the taxation and spending budgets, and indeed over the spending habits and characteristics of the members. It's Greece and Ireland, it's now Portugal and probably Spain, um, have been running deficits and they've been running relatively higher inflation, they've had, had booming housing markets in an environment where we still have a very disciplined central bank in the ECB, which is essentially a successor to the Bundesbank in culture, namely that they will provide a very high level of inflation control and discipline. The result of which is that they have been unable, as they were previously, to inflate themselves out of trouble, depreciate their currency and get back to being solvent and economically active. We now have the worst of both worlds. The worst of both worlds is we have very high levels of sovereign debt, so we have, we have very uh, poorly capitalised, probably bankrupt banking systems, certainly in Ireland. The government of Ireland has had to bail out the banking system, but Ireland as a sovereign isn't really in a position to do that. Therefore, its own debt has now had to be, in effect, guaranteed by the ECB, which is, in effect, the Eurozone countries. So you now have a position whereby you have all the disadvantages from the perspective of Ireland of the austerity measures now required, of the uncompetitiveness of the weak demand. You have control exercised from Brussels and from the ECB, but you have none of the future. So, so if you have an Argentinian-style currency crisis, you have all of this happen, but you have a collapse of your currency, and all of a sudden your wine and your meat and your, your grain is very good value on the, on the world's markets, and your export demand soars. So Argentina, which had a horrible crash in 2001, a real currency disaster, and currency and banking disaster, has recovered very strongly from that because it's had a very weak currency. Ireland isn't capable of having weak currency because it doesn't have a currency. And therein lies, I think, pressures, which I am very concerned indeed will lead to one or more countries exiting the euro. What we are being told is that we have no choice, that there is no alternative. A government with no mandate will do a deal with people whom nobody has ever elected. The aspect of potential Eurozone exit, which is so worrying, is that the damage that will be wrought by that is political, that's manageable, um, is not economic, quite the opposite. If you leave the Eurozone as a weak country and your new currency is worth 50% less, you'll have a wonderful time. You'll be a bit poorer, but you'll all be in work again. That's fine. The problem is that we now have a European banking system which has been told that it is illegal and indeed impossible to distinguish between the currency that assets in Dublin are denominated in the currency that assets in Frankfurt are denominated in. So they've assigned no capital to that currency risk. When that currency risk becomes evident by a fall in the value of the Dublin assets by 50%, a number, yet again we will be in a new, a new subprime environment that the assets owned by the European banking system will be discovered ex post and rather surprisingly all to be located in the weak currency countries and the liabilities will magically all appear to be in Frankfurt and that'll be because the customer currently has a choice. If you're a Greek you can borrow euros today on your secured on your house you can put the money in a bank you can take the notes you can fly over to Frankfurt and deposit them in the name of a German company in Frankfurt they will stay as euros that's a free option and everyone around Europe is doing that now. So if and when we have an exit, 
in my opinion, we will have another round of severe damage to the European and therefore world, world Bank balance sheets, just at a time when bank balance sheets are very damaged by the subprime and then the credit crunch. Whereas, in a sense, I'm very keen that the inconsistencies in the euro come to the fore and indeed that the poor economic performance of the peripheral countries can be restored back to health and they can get back to work. I'm extremely worried that if it happens now, it will very severely damage the banks who will then have to go back to the sovereigns. And then, in at least in principle, it could be that that will provoke yet another round of, of, of sovereign crises because the weight of the bank balance sheets on the sovereigns will be too hard to bear and it'll probably all come back to the UK, France and Germany. Most of the questions about the Eurozone today, which I get, are framed by reference to default. So, so the questions are this. Will Spain or will Greece default on its debt? And what I say is you're asking the wrong question. The question is not whether they'll default, because I can't answer that any better than you can, and currently the market's are pricing in a 50% chance of Greek default within five years, or something like that. The question seems to me to be that there is a quadrant of choices, four choices, if you're Greece. Not default, that means you spend a great deal of your future GDP and taxes on paying back loans at very high interest rates, extremely painful. It can be done, but it won't be fun living in Greece. Default, all the consequences that brings, probably control of much of your banking system and certainly quite a lot of your sovereign lending by the ECB. But there are two other choices. Not default, but leave the Eurozone. Now, you could do that. That's different, because that would reduce the real value of your debt that you owe, international value, by the extent that you would devalue your currency, probably 50% in the case of Greece, that sort of number, halve the value. And you'd also get back to work, because all of a sudden, Greece would become a relatively low-cost tourist destination. All the ships and the shipping and all the things they do well would all of a sudden be good value again and they'd be off again. So you could, so it's not default, it's default stay in the Eurozone, leave the Eurozone not default, and the fourth quadrant is default and leave the Eurozone. So there are four choices, not two. And what's interesting is when I hear these things talked about, I hear only two choices. I hear default, not default, and the not default is usually associated with a bailout because things are so bad. But the other two choices are available. It's just that politically, they're still not sufficiently acceptable as a concept to be mentioned in official circles. They're mentioned in what are called journalistic and analyst circles, but not in official ones. And we have to, by a consistent strategic approach, continue to seek to convince markets that we are serious about our strategic objectives, which is to maintain a strong currency and a price stability in the euro area. That's fundamental. What does all that mean for ordinary people? It means how do we maintain standards of living? How do we regain lost uh, growth? How do we improve competitiveness? How do we increase market share? How do we have export-led growth? If, if the Prime Minister of Ireland came to me and said, what should I do? I'd say, by far, the best alternative is to leave the eurozone, not default, re-denominate in the new punt, the new punt at the old the official old exchange rate, it'll fall in the markets tomorrow by, let's say, 50%. The international purchasing power of the debt you now owe the world is 50% lower than it would otherwise have been. There will be a certain amount of litigation, I suspect, but because people will say, no, 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 you borrowed euros and you're rep repaying me in punt. But I will say to you, it wasn't regarded as a default when Germany, who had issued bonds in Deutschmarks, re-denominated them all in euros in 1999, 1st of January. They all went to euros and everyone said, OK, fair dues. You chose to do that. You've done it. It's not default. So if that's the theory we've now established, you can change your currency, then you can change it back again. And I'm sure there'll be a tremendous amount of potential challenge. But in reality, that is a solution which will stick. And so then I would say if you don't default, you remain uh, a viable an offer or in the international markets. And everyone would very quickly understand what a new punt was like, and they would actually get out their textbooks and remind themselves what it used to be like in the 80s and 90s. It used to be pegged to the pound, no longer. Will it be pegged to the pound? Lots of interesting questions. Have your own interest rate, have your own inflation rate, you're off. So, so if you are a net importing country, your, your currency will fall. Your exports will become more attractive. And, and for Ireland, for Greece, it gets you back to work. The big problem for Ireland and Greece is they've got this huge mountain, this burden of interests, interest payments to climb, and they're having to put people out of work. The public sector is contracting and the private sector is contracting, and there's no way in which you can get them back to work because there's nothing you can offer. If you can get their price down, if you can get the price down by a devaluation of the exchange rate, 
all of a sudden, everyone gets back to work. And you know, we in the UK discovered that on more than one occasion in the 70s and again in the 90s, that you can get us back to work if you get a depreciation of your own currency. And it's the lack of that ability in the Eurozone which has made it so painful. So, I mean, if you make your currency so inflexible that the market can't adjust to the new levels of demand and the new prices in Ireland, then Ireland will do what it's done for 150 years, which is it will adjust its econ economy, not by repaying its debt or by devaluing its currency, but by people leaving. So you will have, you having had net immigration for the last 10, maybe 15, no, probably 10 years into Ireland, you'll now have, I suspect, depopulation, funnily enough, which will make the debt problem worse. I mean, this isn't a solution to Ireland's problems. This is a solution for individual Irishmen who can come and work anywhere in the EU and indeed would typically come and work in the UK or maybe go and work in the Middle East. And I see that as a very bad way of solving a particular problem. And it'll leave Ireland, the state, with probably an unbridgeable gap because there won't be enough tax revenue. Um, and you know, it's just not the answer. It's not the way to conduct an economy, to export your people. You should export the goods your people make and you should make them in your country. And you should do that by making them attractively priced. And the whole point of exchange rates is that's the mechanism by which it's done. So I'd be very keen indeed on, on, on the periphery countries, the ones that can't cope with the iron discipline of the old Bundesbank to, to peel away and we could, I think it would be very plausible to have what you might call a super euro, which would be core Europe in a monetary union if they want to have. I personally don't think there are any huge advantages, but they might want to have it for monetary discipline. But for all the periphery countries with very different structures, quite a lot of, of housing and tourism based, um, much more, much higher um, endemic inflation levels be much better for them economically to have their own currencies. There is absolutely no room for complacency. Um, and I wouldn't suggest that for a moment, and certainly not a country like Ireland who have now had to draw down a facility, who have a four-year national recovery plan, who are in the process now of implementing that plan. Um, it is important that one has to emphasise again that there's an inextricable link between the interests of our own interests and the interests of the euro area. If you think that the likelihood of a departure of the, of the Eurozone is, is positive, non-zero, the market probably isn't thinking that way. So there's probably some what you might call pre-discounting opportunities for investors who wish to protect themselves against the, consequen the consequences of a Eurozone departure to invest in those instruments now and then when the world comes to the view that that might happen indeed if it does happen, they will become very valuable. That's, if you like, work in progress at record in the thing we call the Euro Protection Fund.